National Integration Council. But that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, that's one bureaucratic organization where you accommodate every um, possible politician who has lost this election. <laughs> so if you want really to build a nation and at the same time you want to contribute to building a society, to building a global society which is based on the principles of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which are the Indian values given by our soldiers, I think the first priority is to see how we can bring about creative and constructive cooperation. And I think creative and constructive cooperation, that is very important. It is not just coexistence. And of course, you can only have creative and constructive cooperation if you follow Swami Vivekananda's message of universal acceptance and tolerance. So I would have expected that in the 158th year of Swami Vivekananda's uh, birth anniversary, that those who are following his message will come out with some concepts as to how do you take this message of universal acceptance and uh, tolerance to the next level. And the next level is the creative and constructive cooperation between uh, different communities and different religions of India. And none of them has been able to present to me that they have even thought about this. All they say that we go to a village and we do some social work there and we go to some slum area and we do some social work there. And nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's a good idea to do some social work and to look after the underprivileged people of the society. But if you are saying that you are celebrating the 150th uh, anniversary of Swami Vivekananda, and if you assume that, uh, if, you, if you assume for a moment that the genetics uh, had developed uh, at that time uh, as it is likely to develop in the next 50 years, then the, from Swami Vivekananda would be probably alive today. In which case, if in 1893 he gave a message of uh, universal tolerance and what is the message that he would give today? How would his thoughts advance? That is what he should have thought. And nobody has, nobody has uh, come out with this. But leave aside what has been lost, I think this is what we need to uh, work towards in, uh, in, in future. And I hope that since Vishwa Adhyan Kendra has uh, Adhyan in, uh, uh, in its middle name, I hope you will give some thoughts uh, to see how you can take this message ahead of how to build a society which is based on constructive and creative cooperation between different uh, uh, constituencies, uh, between different constituents of the Indian society. The second uh, lesson that we can draw from the experience and the teachings of various people is that you have to have science and philosophy going together as the two main wills of your society. Here in Mumbai, they think share market and real estate market are the wills of the society. They are OK. They are important. They are required. They are your day-to-day -day realities. But they are not the wills of the society. You are. If you want the Indian society to move ahead, if you want to build a nation, if you want to do a Punar Nirman, if you want to create a, a, a new India, then we have to seek how science and philosophy both can play a central role in taking the nation ahead. And then once we decide as a society that these are the two elements which are most required, then there can be a lot of debate as to how to go about it, not that there has to be a full agreement across the country. But science and technology, they, do, they have to uh, go ahead. Now, with regards to science and technology, let us see where we are and where we can go. What, let me ask, somebody wants to be a volunteer, I want to ask a question. Anybody? Okay. What's your name, sir? Okay. What is the most significant development taking place on the border of Tamil Nadu and Kerala? Uh, basically, these two South Indian countries, <laughs> states, they are uh, trying to overcome all their poverty and they are working very hard towards the improving their cultural uh, this thing, although they have big fight between themselves. But individually, they are uh, trying to progress faster. OK, thank you. Anybody else? Hmm? Professor Page, you want to, you want to try? Yeah. 
Yeah, the famous dam issue between the Iruki dam. Yeah, it is it is a water problem. So, that they are so going one at a time, one at a time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you. The same thing I want to do. Okay. So uh, the water dispute, the uh, 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 what? How will you summarize what he said? Yeah, the water hmm. dispute two stages regarding the sharing of the water. A and B, the, the dam which is likely to collapse according to the. Uh, okay. Uh, now of course there is no correct answer to any question like that because this is a very subjective question and there are uh, various answers. But I will tell you what I think is the most significant development taking place in the border areas of Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, Kerala. Okay. Before that, let me just step out of India for a minute and let me look at what is the most significant development taking place in the whole world? And then I will come to Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala in a minute. The most significant development taking place in the whole world is an effort being made to challenge the laws of physics, and especially the laws as laid down by Einstein. Now, if you change the laws of physics, or if you find that the laws of physics are wrong, even if uh, by a small percentage, and if you find that some of the laws of physics need to be uh, revised or relooked at, the whole world will change. Everything will change. Right from your space missions to your microelectronics to everything, absolutely everything will change. If you find that there was some problem in the laws of physics as, as uh, uh, explained by uh, Einstein, everything will, uh, everything will change. So the most significant development, that's uh, one of the two most significant developments taking place, that's uh, uh, anywhere around the world, is the whole questioning of the basic laws of physics. And particularly, the law which says that the light, uh, 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 that the speed of light is the fastest uh, 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 traveling phenomenon. And there is nothing that can break the speed of light. Now there is only one thing that has come close to breaking the speed of light. And for a moment, the scientists thought it had actually broken the speed of light. Then they realized that there was some uh, technical flaw uh, in the experiment, and they withdrew. And that was last year, when they found that neutrinos, which is a small particle, uh, had broken the speed, speed of light. But then they realized there was a mistake in this scientific uh, experiment. and. Uh, uh, neutrino has not actually broken the speed of light, and so the Einstein's uh, theory remains valid. But still, neutrinos are important because they are the ones which come very, very close to the speed of light. Just very, 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 very close. Maybe, and I, I mean, there's, the speed of neutrino is maybe 99.99999% 99 .99 of the uh, speed of light. So the work on neutrinos is going to be the second most important work that's going to happen in the world, and that is what is going to decide how the world will be shaped over the next 500 or 1,000 years. What comes out of the experiments on uh, experimental work on neutrino will decide, uh, will be one of the two, three things that will decide. There is also corresponding work taking place on molecular biology. That will also play a role in how the world will be shaped over the next 500 to 1,000 years. So neutrinos, I would say, not number one, but definitely one of the two, three uh, programs which will decide uh, not just 400 years, fine. this is a lot more important than your value of rupee or whatever Mr. Kalapuri said that what you are going to say today is less important than the value of rupee. But I can tell you Mr. Kalapuri, the value of rupee is an issue which is relevant for next 10, 15 days. The uh, uh, laws of physics are going to be important for next 1,000 years <laughs> or maybe next 10,000 years. <laughs> So uh, now this, so therefore, along with what's happening in molecular biology, along with what's happening in the creation of life in laboratories, uh, and along with what's happening at the Large Hadron Collider where they are working on the Higgs boson, uh, the work on neutrinos is the most 
significant, one of the five most significant developments taking place in the world, not only taking place in the world today, but in the, uh, in the world over the last 100 years, which will have an impact over next 1,000, next 2,000, next 5,000 years. And the world's largest neutrino observatory or laboratory is being built on the border of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So what happens on the border of Tamil Nadu and Kerala is going to determine or going to, I would not say determine is too strong, but is going to influence how the entire universe, work, universe works uh, over the next 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 years. And you think that a dime issue is more important than this? <laughs> and that's not your fault. It's frankly the fault of the Indian media. Because you don't, you are not aware, I'm sure, if you had known that there is a largest neutrino observatory being built on the border of Tamil Nadu and Kerala, of course you would have recognized that this is the most significant development taking place there. But the Indian media has uh, very different kind of priorities. Uh, I'm in fact surprised that they are talking about the uh, dam dispute on uh, 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 the, the border of Tamil Nadu and Kerala because I thought their priorities were a lot more significant like the, uh, um, uh, the, the color of uh, dress that uh, Priyanka Chopra or whatever her name is wears at the evening parties and uh, for how much money the cricketers are auctioned. So cricketers being auctioned is your front page news. Amitabh Bachchan tweeting about some uh, um, uh, issue here or there is your front page news. And the Indian scientists have built the world's largest, are building the world's largest uh, 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 neutrino laboratory is something that Indian media doesn't think is important enough to communicate to the Indian public. But because the media is shallow and because the media is, uh, uh, has got its priorities wrong, doesn't mean that everybody in India has uh, got their priorities wrong. Fortunately, the scientists and even the bureaucrats whom we all blame are, uh, have the right sense and, and, and they, are, they are putting in resources and they are putting in the effort to build this. And this is not an uh, exceptional experiment. Not too far, far from here, in Pune, last year, something came up in Pune, and that's in the field of biology. Asia's first biosafety level four laboratory is in Pune. It was set up last year. Now, this is the only laboratory in Asia, perhaps with the exception of China, because in China, what happens, you don't come to know. So, at least in terms of what is the public knowledge, this is the only uh, laboratory uh, and by Asia, I don't mean mostly East and Southeast Asia. I'm not talking about the West Asia where Israelis would have it anyway, underground or overground. Uh, uh, the first, uh, 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 and the Israelis, I must say, I admire them in some ways, that they will do all this, even dare to do it uh, in, in Haifa, uh, not too far from the border of uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, despite all the worry of uh, missiles coming from Hezbollah or whatever. So. Uh, so Asia's top uh, uh, first biosafety uh, level four laboratory is in Pune. And this is a small news on page number nine of the Times of India. But even though the media thinks it's not important, the government of India provided 75 crore rupees to set, set this up last year. So all these politicians and all these bureaucrats whom you blame are actually a lot more sensible than we give them credit for. Despite all their weaknesses and all their uh, uh, corrupt practices and all their, all their problems uh, which we all recognize and which we must fight against. We should not accept uh, corruption, we should not accept uh, criminality, but we must, we must understand that they are doing something constructive out there. So when we look at creating a base of science and technology, you have, you have uh, uh, some very good uh, experiments taking place in India, right from uh, uh, theoretical physics to, uh, to molecular biology. Now this laboratory in Pune would be able to uh, uh, detect and work on 
any case of bioterrorism in the world. So if you have a problem with bioterrorism, you can come to Pune and uh, uh, you can consult this laboratory, you can try to solve the problem. And bioterrorism is going to be a significant problem. And you have a, you have a solution right here in uh, Pune, or at least an effort to find a solution right here in Pune. But while the government is doing this, and while there are also many experiments taking place at the grassroots level, for instance, in Pune itself, there's a small company uh, which has created a, a, a tool whereby a mobile phone can, uh, uh, can dial an electric pump uh, half an hour away uh, and see whether there's electricity or not and uh, uh, so the, uh, help the farmers to save his trip. And there are many, many, many such small experiments taking place the organized Indian private sector is missing from this effort. And it's a shame. You had Institute of Science in Bangalore, which was established in 1919. You had Indian Institute of Technology. The whole plan of that was uh, uh, finalized in uh, 1940, just before 1947. Though the first institute uh, of technology was actually uh, inaugurated by Pandit Nehru after he became the uh, prime minister, but the uh, entire planning and everything was done before 47. CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, was set up in 1943. TIFR was set up in 1946. And TIFR and Institute of Science both came into existence because of Institute of Science because of Damshedji Tata and TIFR because of JRD Tata. So the Indian private sector played a tremendous role prior to the independence in creating foundation for uh, advanced science and technology in India. What have they done since 1947? Give me one example in the private sector. There's a lot that's been done by the government. There is the Chandrayaan which was uh, created by uh, ISRO which is in the government sector. There is this uh, uh, Biosafety Level 4 lab, which is the latest, uh, which I mentioned, this is done in the government sector. There are so many things which are done in the government sector. What is it done by the um, uh, organized private sector? Mobile phones, internet. Mo mobile phones, internet, uh, um, uh, since, uh, have they invented it? Yes. All imported. All imported. All they have done is just, just the CKD, just, uh, just the assembly. And what is the result of that? The result is that in some critical areas, because you can't really go ahead only with the effort of the government and the small time experiments which are taking place at the grassroots uh, level. India is falling way behind. For instance, uh, one of the most critical tools today in any field, whether it is biology or whether it is chemistry, is the computers. Without a computer, you can't do chemistry. Without a computer, you can't do biology, you can't do anything. The fastest supercomputer uh, that we have, that is in China. And the Chinese computer has a speed of 54 petaflops. Now, one petaflop is 1,000 trillion calculations per second. So 54 petaflops means China has a computer, which is the only computer in the world which is, there is no such computer in the US, no such computer in the UK, Japan, not even in Israel, uh, not in uh, 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 Japan, uh, not anywhere else, which is capable of thinking at a much faster rate than the human mind. Because human mind thinking goes to about 20 to 30 petaflop. The second fastest computer in the world, so the first is 54 petaflop China. The second fastest computer in the world is owned by the US military. And that is 18 petaflop, which is one third of the Chinese speed. So this is where China is 54 petaflop. This is where US is 18 petaflop. And the fastest computer in India is 0 0.18 petaflop, which is one hundredth of the fastest US computer and one upon 300 of the fastest Chinese uh, computer. And why these things is happening? Because Dr. Karmarkar, who developed this uh, super fast computer of 0 0.18 petaflop, 
was rewarded in the very next, next month by uh, termination of his job. <laughs> so this is how our private sector behaves. You develop a supercomputer, you are thrown out of a job. So we don't want to produce anything. We don't want to invest anything. Recently, there is a whole crop has come of uh, private sector people being uh, involved in setting up of the educational institutions, both private sector, both uh, uh, private private sector and the political private sector. <laughs> and sometimes I'm invited by these institutions to, uh, to meet with the directors. And I tell them, I said, look, you people are stupid. You have very small, small ambition. So they say, how? I said, yeah, we have to make money. I said, no, no, you have to make money, but just in terms of making money, your ambition is extremely small. Because what is your model? You want to take a capitation fee of 20 lakh rupees from a student, and then you will have 100 students, or 200 students, whatever, and altogether your business will be some 50 crore rupees a uh, year. Uh, Mr. Pankaj Bhujbal is not here. I don't ask him. I, I would have asked him. Uh, what is the turnover of MET? I won't ask Mr. Pagay and put him in a trouble. Five uh, <laughs> <laughs> only five crores. So you have at the most uh, 10, 20, 